name is Anna Sarah, and I'm Director of Listings Development with the Canadian Securities Exchange. And welcome to our fourth edition of the Weekly Market Recap. I'm joined today by my co-host, uh, Bruce Campbell with Stonecastle Investment Management. Thank you for joining me, Bruce. Yeah, it's a uh, short holiday week this week. It was a short work week. I think we still maybe work just as hard. Maybe we got as much in four days as we normally do in five. I don't know if you feel the same way. <laughs> well, I know I'm looking forward to the weekend. Absolutely. Um, It was a bit of a quieter week on the markets. Uh, We are going to be touching on one of the big stories was a Bitcoin ETF that came to market in Canada. Um, And I believe two by the end of the week have come to market. So we're going to touch on that. We're going to talk about Verano Holdings. It is a CSE issuer that came to market this week. Some great volume and the increase in the share price was pretty wonderful to watch. Um, And then we're going to dive into retail participation. Uh, You know, we've been talking over the past few weeks about GameStop and silver squeezes and just the general retail um, movement that's happening within the market. So we're going to talk about just the retail participation that we're seeing. So let's jump in. Uh, Bruce, let's talk about the Bitcoin ETF that came to market this week. Yeah, sure thing. So uh, so actually our partner, Purpose, who uh, we manage some funds for, they have another fund that they launched this week on the, on the ETF side, which is a Bitcoin fund, which is you know quite interesting because it really allows access to Bitcoin in ways that people haven't had before. You know, you don't have to have a Bitcoin wallet and, you know, go through all that rigmarole. You can do it right in your, you know, TSFA or RSP and allows you to, you know, within reason track where, uh, where Bitcoin's headed. And of course, you know, Bitcoin's been super hot, obviously, you know, there's been a lot of different news items there that have propelled it. And it, you know, just keeps on going, had another strong week this week, probably, you know, in a large part, to the back of this because they've you know they've raised a fair bit of money in in their first two days of uh, have history so um so you were saying that i think on the first day there was about 150 million that was put in within the canadian capital markets that's right yeah so you know basically the way an etf works is is uh they sell units of that fund and then new units are created of that fund as investor demand comes in so during the day as um, new investors were trying to buy into um, into the ETF, they would have created new units of the ETF, which would have brought basically brings assets into that fund. And uh, yeah, from what I understand, it was somewhere around uh, about 150 million uh, yesterday. Uh, I haven't seen the numbers for today, but I certainly wouldn't be surprised if it was right along the same. Uh, same amount as as yesterday, you know, sort of in that $150 million range, just because, you know, there would have been a lot of people who didn't know about it yesterday, who would have heard about it last night, and then, you know, invested in it today. That And it's a huge amount of money. I mean, that's just the Canadian capital markets, and that's into Bitcoin, because there's no other holdings in that ETF other than Bitcoin, right? That's right. I mean, based on their perspectives, their primary mandate is to invest, you know, majority or all of the assets into Bitcoin itself. So it's not spread amongst a number of different cryptocurrencies. They, you know, aren't invested somewhere else. It's it's just strictly Bitcoin. Wow. I, you know, it's so interesting because even I find myself um, more, more intrigued to look at the ETF as opposed to going and opening an online wallet and buying it directly. I, I don't know why that is. Um, maybe I'm just old. <laughs> well, um, I know it's it's a lot easier nowadays to do it um, than it has been in the past. You know, b- before when you had to, you know, go to a company, get the wallet set up and go through, you know, that whole process. It was very, it was very time consuming, challenging. You know, this obviously makes it a lot easier. Um, you just basically can go in and buy like any stock. You can hold it in your regular account. You know, all the custodians will, you know, settle it in T plus two. It makes it pretty straightforward. And, yeah. and, you know, the other thing is interestingly enough, there's, there's been some history in Canada of, of some of these, uh, you know, crypto, um, wallet companies, uh, where they've disappeared with the money, right. Or disappeared with the, the with the currency. Uh, so you don't have to worry about that because, you know, obviously this is a trust that's been set up and, you know, it trades through exchanges and has proper custodians and, you know, is audited by, you know, a big, probably a big five auditor. So, you know, all that is obviously in place, right? Well, and it's also nice because um, when there's a bit more volatility within an investment, it's nice to be able to take advantage of your TFSA or your RSP, you know, kind of those tax havens, um, you know, for potential capital gains, right? For sure. Yeah. Um, do you think that this will be a trend? Do you think we're going to see more of this or is there going to be more 
cryptocurrency ETFs coming to market? I certainly wouldn't be surprised. I mean, obviously, being the you know the trendsetter um, trailblazer is is always difficult. There probably was a, a lot of hoops that they had to go through with regulators to get this set up. You know, once they've had those discussion with the regulators, they become a lot easier for the next person to come along and do it. And you know, with the amount of money that they've raised in a very short period of time, it's probably going to end up being quite profitable for them. So I wouldn't be surprised if you saw, you know, a lot of other companies who do ETFs come into the market with, you know, a Bitcoin. And then obviously there's a number of other different digital currencies out there as well. And so then you start to get, you know, people who want different digital currencies or, you know, maybe it evolves to a place where it's actively managed, where a portfolio manager is making a decision on, oh, do we buy, you know, Dogecoin versus Bitcoin versus, you know, Litecoin versus, you know, Tesla coin or whatever, you know, other cryptocurrency comes up. Right. And that's, you know, sort of the next evolution that you probably see after individual, you know, mandated, uh, mandated ETFs. Well, I'm super intrigued to watch how this, uh, this part of the sector will evolve. We're going to talk about Verano. We talked about Verano a few weeks ago. Verano came to market on the CSC. Um, and we talked about it a few weeks ago because it is, uh, I think, one of the largest companies that's come to the CSE. It is a U.S. MSO, a multi-state operator, and its valuation, I think, was $2.8 billion, I think, around there when it came to market. Um, so we welcomed them. First day of trading was on Wednesday. Um, I believe they traded volume about $1.8 million. Thursday, about 464000 in volume. Um, and I think it was approaching four hundred by the end of Friday. Um, you know, keep in mind, this is trading around the $31, $32 mark. So that's, that's a lot of market capitalization that's moving back and forth. Um, but really the intriguing part about it is, um, you know, they did a raise before they went public, right? And there's quite an increase in that price. Yeah, they did a $10 US offering and the stock's trading in the 30s Canadian. And at the time, you know, it was super hard to get a hold of. Um, you know, everybody, everybody wanted to get everybody who was in the cannabis market and probably people who even weren't heard about, you know, kind of where they were coming out from a valuation standpoint, where compared to its um, other MSOs and, you know, the fact that there was probably the potential for it to have a fairly good run up. And even from the period when they, you know, did the uh, financing and closed the financing until they got listed, there was quite a run up in the MSOs. And so, you know, that obviously boosted it more. And I mean, it, if you were able to get a hold of it, it's been a it's been a pretty nice investment for sure. Yeah, I mean that's amazing, right? And and it's so exciting when we're kind of in in that uh, in that valuation range is quite something to watch. Um, I think we'll continue to see MSOs coming to market, don't you? Yeah, I would I would think so for sure. Yeah. Can you just describe to our viewers what an MSO is? Yeah, so in the U.S., it's the you know because it's not federally regulated like it is in Canada. Uh, or nationally licensed, um, what ends up happening is each individual state is responsible for their own, you know, cannabis programs because it's still federally illegal. And so if you're within, you know, the borders of that state, you can operate, but you can't operate or you can't take anything across state lines. So, you know, what a number of these companies have done is they've started operations in one state. So say maybe they're in, you know, Pennsylvania, and they also want to be in New Jersey, and at the same time, Florida, well, they have to have separate operations in each of those areas. And as opposed to, you know, sort of thinking about it in Canadian terms, where you'd have, you know, maybe one operation in Ontario and you distribute it across the country, well, they have to have individual operations in each of those states. And so, you know, there's companies that focus only on one state, but a number of these companies have decided they're going to grow bigger, you know, obviously probably with the anticipation that eventually it gets federally legalized. And so they have multiple operations in multiple states and that's where the MSO comes from. Must be logistically nuts for those big guys to be managed across the country, right? Well, they just have duplicate operations everywhere. They can use best practices across the board, but, you know, they can't say, oh, hey, we're short of, you know, this this input in you know this area and we're going to take it to that area yeah. it, it can't cross state lines it's it's a it's illegal and and you know so they don't they're not able to do it and they, and they don't so and i think you touched on a really good point there because i remember you know when the mso's really started to come to market that was really kind of the pie in the sky was the fact that at one point it would be federally legal and they would have already branched themselves across the country so that's kind of that's the end game i think for them on the most part 
Yeah, from an investor standpoint, it's kind of, you know, it's, it's quite interesting, right? The investors and the companies have sort of two different agendas with this. Um, if you're sitting at an MSO, you probably don't want legalization to happen anytime soon because, you know, you're basically, you have a moat around your business right now. And as long as you can raise capital, you can continue to go out and expand and it becomes more difficult for anyone else to, because they can't access the same capital that you can. And we've seen that recently because, you know, a lot of the MSOs have come to market with fairly big financings. And we've talked about that, you know, here, if you're an investor, you probably want the federal legalization because then that brings all of these foreign or all these investors that have been locked out of being able to invest in cannabis because it's so federally illegal. It brings them into the market and that's going to push valuations, you know, way up. And we know, you know, in, in the U S they tend to pay a lot higher for growth multiples than we do in Canada. And these things are, you know, huge growth multiples, right? If, if you, you know, you sort of look at the, the rate that, most of these cannabis companies are growing and the multiples that you're paying, it's uh, it's like no other industry out there. Um, okay, we're going to end off today talking a little bit about retail participation. Um, I mean, I, I don't know about you, but this is the most retail participation I've ever seen in my experience in the markets. Would you say the same? Yeah, I mean, back in 99, 2000, there seemed to be a lot back then as well. Uh, we saw a lot of sort of similarities to what we're seeing today. Um, you know, not, not, you know, nothing is actually, you know, history never actually repeats, but it certainly rhymes. And we're seeing, you know, a lot of those similar type of things. It's interesting, you know, when you look at the whole GameStop and what happened there, you know, there was a company in Canada called KTEL, which used to put together these, you know, records that they used to sell online. And they were, you know, sort of like cheesy, you know, party dance music. Uh, and they announced in, I think it was 1999 that they were going to, they were going to go online and uh, sell their stuff online as opposed to doing the infomercials on TV only. And uh, the stock shot way up because there was a lot of short volume on or a lot of short on it. And all those shorts got squeezed and it went up. It's a similar type of thing that happened to, to GameStop. So we're seeing a lot of similarities to what we saw before, but certainly, you know, now with technology, I think there's probably even more adoption because back then you still had to go on a computer, you know, if you were lucky enough to have, you know, sort of higher speed, um, internet, you, you use higher speed internet. Well, now, you know, all of us just have a phone and we just, you know, we can trade Robinhood off our phone. And in a lot of cases, you're not paying any commission. Whereas, you know, back, you know, 20 years ago, you were still paying fairly significant commissions. So yeah, it's brought in a whole new form of investor. And then if you sort of believe the stats where they talk about the fact that, you know, all these government um, bailout checks that have come, not all of them, but, 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 but a large part of them, are gone into people's hands who maybe necessarily didn't need the money. So they're investing it and they're doing it, you know, in their Robinhood account and trading like that. So it has brought in, you know, kind of a whole new realm of investor that we haven't seen for, for, you know, probably 20 years. You know, I started in the, I was a broker in 2002 and I think people will be quite shocked to know some of the commissions that went through <laughs> on, on a lot of the stuff that we went through. I mean, like thousands of dollars of commission, you know, on a big trade would go through. It was, it was pretty nuts. Yeah. D markets have definitely changed. Do you think the retail, um, the retail investor is aiding in price discovery? Is it hindering it as a fund manager? How do you view this in the market? Yeah, I mean, right now, it's kind of a double-edged sword. Right now, I mean, it, it means there's lots of liquidity and there's lots of volume. The thing that we always have to manage for is we don't know when that's going to disappear and it's going to go back to, you know, lower volume and less retail participation. You know, maybe it doesn't. Maybe this is kind of a new paradigm and we're seeing, you know, something different this time. They often say that's kind of the most dangerous words in, in investing, right? Is this time it's different. So, you know, we're treating it as that's the case. And so we always have to manage our liquidity. And so we're constantly watching like, yeah, maybe this stock trades with more liquidity than it will, you know, when the retail participation disappears. And so as a result, we have to manage that within our portfolio. Like, okay, well, can we take a position in that smaller company? Can we, you know, take a position in the stock that doesn't trade very much? Um, and we're constantly balancing that off against, you know, obviously the fundamental and technical work that we do to determine whether or not it's a good investment. Well, it'll be so interesting to see how long this this retail sentiment runs. I mean, I I think people they're around, they've opened their accounts, they've put money in, they're trading. Um, you know, it'll be interesting to see how long this lasts. Yeah, I mean, it, it, that's the one thing that none of us none of us know, right? Uh, I think probably the the Fed 
in the US probably has a big bearing on how long it'll last, you know, as they start to tighten up the, the spigots and have a little less free money, then, um, then, you know, typically that, that's, you know, what puts the brakes on, on the party, as they say, you know, it's the taking the punch bowl away from the party. But at this point in time, you know, they, they doubled their balance sheet last year. It's probably going to take the market, you know, a year to two years to really kind of get their head wrapped around that and to, you know, really get that money, that liquidity that's gone into the system, you know, into the market or to, to find its home. And so, you know, we probably have a little while yet, um, but certainly, you know, at some point in time, you'll, you'll want to be a little bit more cautious than not. Absolutely. Well, it was a shorter week in the markets and a little bit quieter, but there's still lots going on. Um, again, I'm excited to see this Bitcoin ETF and, and some of the cryptocurrency ETFs that we might start to see. Um, excited about Verano uh, joining us and what we saw there on the market. And uh, hopefully uh, the retail market stays on and stays strong, right? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you again, Bruce. Uh, it was a great week. Looking forward to next week. Yeah, we'll see you next week again.